Okay, this video is going to be a quick introduction to using Inkscape to design pieces for laser cutting. Um, by default, when you open up Inkscape uh, with a new document, I think the in most cases the default is going to be to start off with an A4 canvas. Um, now what I'm going to do here, let's actually start off with a new document. So let's open a new document here. So there's our blank A4 canvas. Um, the first thing I would normally do when I'm preparing to do something for the laser cutter is to just set the page size to the maximum size of sheet that we can use on our Epilog laser cutter. So the maximum sheet size we can work with is 600 by 300 millimeters. So under the file menu, um, I'm going to select document properties. And here I'm going to set the width of the page to be 600 millimeters and I'm going to set the height to be 300. Now it's worth checking while you're in here as well that the display units are set to millimeters. Um, that is the default on the version of Inkscape that I'm using, but it may not be the case for every version. Um, so these display units are how we're going to specify the coordinates and dimensions of shapes and points on shapes uh, when we place them on the canvas. So it's going to be most convenient if the display units are set to millimeters. Um, all right, so I'm going to close the document properties and uh, you can pan and zoom in Inkscape uh, using the plus and minus keys to zoom in and out. So you can zoom in or zoom out uh, using plus and minus. And if you hold down the control key, then the arrow keys allow you to pan um, the canvas left, right, up and down. Uh, however, there are also some shortcut keys to just get the entire canvas positioned a certain way in the frame of view. So at the, mo the one that I find most useful is the number five on the keyboard just zooms the canvas so that it almost completely fills the, uh, the visible frame. Okay, um, before I do anything else, uh, I'm gonna save the file. Um, so I go to the file menu, save as, and I'm just gonna save this as drawing.svg. Uh, where will I put it? I guess I'll put it in my downloads folder. So SVG is short for Scalable Vector Graphics. It's the native file format in Inkscape. Uh, it's also an open standard, it's XML based and it's defined by the W3C uh, organization. Um, so it's quite an interesting file format. Actually, you can open up the files. It's a plain text format, so you can open it in a text editor and take a look. Um, I won't do that now though. So um, there's a couple of other important settings that we want to set up on the document before we get stuck into the real uh, drawing process. So just to try and illustrate the next setting, I'm going to put a shape onto the canvas here and explain a little bit about Inks how Inkscape stores elements in a drawing. So Inkscape is a 2D uh, vector graphics editor. It's an incredibly powerful program, so you can produce exquisite like artworks in this and use it for all kinds of graphic design tasks. What we're going to be doing with it is going to be sort of at the very much the simpler end of what Inkscape is capable of, because for laser cutting, all we really want to do is produce line drawings uh, consisting only of thin black lines. And everywhere that we draw a line, the laser is going to cut. What the laser cutter essentially is doing is it's cutting out two dimensional shapes from a flat sheet of material. Um, in this case, for this example, uh, the material that I'm planning to use is three millimeter plywood. So it's a big sheet of plywood, three millimeters thick, and the laser cutter is just gonna cut out from that sheet, whatever shapes we draw with these thin black lines. Um, however, before we begin drawing our thin black lines, let's draw some other shapes first, just to show how Inkscape stores different visual elements on the canvas. So I've just drawn a rectangle here, and each of the objects that we draw has a fill color, but it also has what they call a stroke color or stroke settings, which define how the outline of the shape is drawn. So at the moment, the fill color of this object is set to black. Um, let me just change that to something else. So I'll change it to this kind of light blue color or cyan color here. And I'm gonna set the outline color to be something different. So maybe I'll set it to be green. Now at the moment, the stroke thickness is set to be very, very thin. So you can almost not see the stroke around the edge of that object. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open up the fill and stroke properties for this object. And I'm gonna make the stroke around the object much thinner, much thicker than it is currently. Uh, so I've used a shortcut key, Control shift f to open up that dialog box for fill and stroke, which has appeared on the right here. 
Um, but like a lot of the other uh, object property dialog boxes, uh, you can find that under the objects menu up here. Um, fill and stroke is up near the top there, second one from the top. We're also going to return to this menu later to access some of the other dialog boxes. In particular, align and distribute is going to be extremely useful for laser cutting. Um, anyway, for now, let's look at the fill and stroke properties for this rectangle shape that I've created here. So this allows you to configure in detail the type of um, color or pattern or texture which is used to fill in the shape. So at the moment it's set to have a flat color fill and the color is set to this cyan color. But let's switch to the stroke paint. You can see that it is also set to be a flat color um, and the color that's selected here is this kind of green shade. But the third tab in the fill and stroke properties is stroke style. And this is where we can specify the thickness of the outline of the shape. So I'm going to make it much thicker so that we can see it very clearly. Let's try making it eight millimeters thick. So you can see now that green outline around the edge of the shape is much thicker than, than it was, right? Um, and this, uh, these properties of fill and stroke will apply to lots of different objects that you can draw in Inkscape. So let's uh, put in an ellipse and put in a star shape. Let's move that star up a little bit. And all of these objects can have these properties configured individually. So for example, let's change the fill color of that star and change its stroke color to be something different. So um, objects in Inkscape basically have this set of properties that we can configure. At the end of the drawing process here, what we're gonna be doing to every object that we've drawn is we're gonna set the fill to be transparent and we're going to set the stroke property to be a very thin, pure, solid black stroke. However, something that we need to be aware of during the drawing process, um, because the stroke thickness um, by default is counted in as part of the dimensions of the object, in order for us to get an accurate measurement of the dimensions of things, the way that they're going to be cut out by the laser, we need to be sure that it's measuring the dimensions not based on the thickness of this line, which ultimately is, you know, we're going to reduce that thickness down to almost nothing, but rather the center of the stroke. So I'll try to illustrate um, what this actually looks like. If I click that rectangle object again there, and I'm going to set the width to be 120. I'm doing this up in the toolbar at the top of the window here. So I'm going to set the width to be 120 for the selected object, which is the rectangle, and I'm gonna set the height to be 100. So this rectangle currently, Inkscape is telling us this is 120 millimeters wide, 100 millimeters high. However, looking at this shape here, I know that actually what the laser is gonna cut out is a line going up the center of that stroke, not where the dotted line currently is. And if I switch to a different view here, so this is just a different way that Inkscape can display the objects that are on the canvas. I'm going to select outline view here. And what that does is instead of showing us the fill and stroke properties of each object, it just shows us where the actual outline of the stroke is as a single pixel black line. And this is ultimately much more similar to what the lines are going to end up as when we get our object laser cut. So you can actually see that this rectangle where the laser is going to cut is quite a bit inside what it's measuring as 120 by 100. So now that we know that the stroke line isn't necessarily in the same place as the width and height and also these X and Y coordinates are shown, we would like to change the settings so that we can make these numbers up here agree with what, act what is actually going to be cut out by the laser. So the way to do that is to go to the edit menu. And at the very bottom of that menu, you'll find preferences. Uh, inside preferences, the default uh, section that will be displayed is tools. And on the very first page here, you'll see visual bounding box, which is the default and geometric bounding box. So the one we want is geometric bounding box. When you select that, you can see that it's measuring the dimensions of the object now based on the center of each stroke and it's ignoring the actual thickness of the stroke. So that's gonna give us a truer representation of the size of the objects that will get cut out. So geometric bounding box is the setting that you want. 
if you don't make that selection at the start, it's not going to be completely obvious during the, tr the drawing process that anything is wrong. But when you get the pieces cut at the end, there's a good chance that some of them will come out to be a different size than you expected, probably a bit smaller than you were expecting. So this is a very important setting to configure. Uh, okay, I'm going to close the preferences uh, dialog box now. So we've got these shapes here. They still have the same fill and stroke properties as we configured them with, as in the colored filling and the colored stroke around the outside. All we've changed at the moment is how Inkscape is displaying these objects to us. However, this view that we're looking at here, which is called outline view, it is a much truer representation of how the shapes are going to end up because we're going to change everything to have a transparent fill and a very thin black stroke around it. So 99% of the time when I'm designing for the laser cutter, I stay in this view in outline view. So outline view can be selected under the view menu in display mode and you can select outline. If you ever want to go back and see what the shapes really look like, you can click on normal and you can discover that, yeah, they still got colored filling and they've still got a colored stroke, but we're going to get rid of those settings at the end anyway. So in the meantime, I just set everything to outline and ignore the fact that there is fill and stroke. As long as you have the geometric bounding box selected, it's safe to do that. We can do all our drawing in this mode. And then at the very end, we're just going to set the fill and stroke properties of everything uh, to be thin black lines. Okay, now that we've got all that out of the way, we're ready to actually start drawing something. Uh, the type of shapes that I've put on the object, on the canvas here, rectangle, ellipse, and a star, they're just three of the standard uh, shape drawing tools that Inkscape provides. In fact, what I use almost all the time for drawing nearly everything is this tool that I'm just hovering over on the left-hand side here, which is the Bezier or Bezier and straight line tool. So you can either click on the button in the toolbar on the left here, or you can also access it by clicking on B, which is the shortcut key. So B short for Bezier. And this is a tool which allows you to draw a path object. So that is an object made of a number of segments joined at nodes. So those segments can be straight lines or they can be Bezier curves. So let's draw one here. So I'm just gonna click a number of times and I'll make this a closed path. So I'm going to make the last click on top of the first node that I clicked on. So there is my shape. And this shape can be moved around. And um, for the purpose of what we're doing here, actually, I'm going to get rid of these other objects. We don't need them for now. So just delete those ones. And let's focus on the path that we've created. So this path is made of a number of straight line segments. Uh, those straight lines meet at something called nodes. So we can display the nodes for this path by switching on or activating the node tool. So that's up near the top of the toolbar here. It also has a shortcut key, which is N for node. Um, I'm going to click on the button there. And now you can see the individual nodes. And these can be moved around to change the shape of the path. Uh, but what you can also do uh, at the nodes is you can select to change the properties of the nodes or the lines that connect two nodes to make them smooth or curved. So for example, uh, this node over here, which I've selected, you can see it's selected because it's a different color to the other ones, it's blue. I'm gonna turn that into a smooth node. So at the moment it's a, you know, an angled corner where two straight lines meet, but I'm gonna turn it into a symmetric node. So I'll click on it there. Uh, once it's a symmetric node, you can see that the line passing through it is now a curve. And we can change the curvature of it and the tangent to the line at that point by dragging these handles around. Um, so we've got a lot of flexibility about how we configure the shape of the curve between these control points or the nodes that we've created. Uh, we can also create at a corner, um, we can add handles to this uh, in order to, oh, what have I done there? Um, in order to create whatever shape we want in between two nodes. Now I have to say most of the time when I'm designing for the laser cutter, the majority of the paths that I draw are made up of straight line segments, but it is certainly very useful sometimes to be able to add a curve using this. Um, there's a number of properties of these path objects which are make them very powerful for putting together laser cutting shapes. Um, and a lot of them are to do with these 
uh, operations which are available under the path menu, which allow us to combine multiple paths in ways that kind of enable us to put more complex shapes together just by combining simpler shapes. Um, so we'll return to this later on to see sort of what the power of creating things as paths is. Um, I will just say in general, um, of all the tools here for drawing different shapes, I do sometimes use the ellipse and the rectangle. But apart from those, by far the one that I use the most is the line and Bezier tool. It's, it's uh, extremely efficient. And once you get used to it, um, it's a very uh, economical tool to work with. So economical with your time and it allows you to design things in a way that the shapes can be adapted and reused uh, very easily. So uh, let's take a look at what I'm actually gonna draw for this example. I think the best way to illustrate how to use Inkscape is just to work through a complete example. So um, what I have on my notebook here, I've just kind of sketched this little, uh, I suppose it's kind of an ornament uh, with a sort of a roof, a square roof, and a sort of a square floor here. And then these four sort of uh, wall panels uh, that cause the roof to sit above the floor. So this is a kind of a typical recurring motif in a laser cutting design where we're building up a three dimensional shape out of 2D pieces. We often cut these uh, slots in one flat piece, which another piece will slot into. Uh, and that's gonna be the case here. So I've drawn out a sort of a flat view of the two different types of piece that I want here. So I'm gonna need two of these pieces here, one for the roof and one for the floor. It's just a square, uh, 80 millimeters on each side, and I'm gonna make these 20 millimeter slots um, around each of the four sides. The four wall panels are just gonna be made up of these, the sort of rectangles, but with an outcropping tab at each end here. So I'm gonna make these um, parts here that extend out at the end of the panel, they're gonna fit into those receiving slots in the wall and the floor. Um, so I'm gonna make these 80 millimeters long and 40 millimeters wide. So the, the length of the, that sort of fin there that's gonna slide into this slot here, that's gonna be 20 millimeters long. And the material that this is gonna be cut out of is three millimeter plywood, as I was saying. So the width of these slots is gonna be three millimeters. Um, now, in fact, by the power of television, I have already cut this one. So um, we can see the pieces here. Let me slot it together there. So this is what the thing actually looks like when it's cut. And um, you can see it's got the four side panels slotted into the roof and the floor. If I take it apart here, you can see those individual pieces. One of the things you'll notice about the laser cut pieces is that they plywood it's a beautiful material to work with actually and, and quite robust and um, so it's a really kind of functionally nice material to work with but aesthetically as well like it's quite pleasing the edges come out with this nice sort of charred look but they're kind of they're not quite as dark as they look on the camera actually in real life so they're they're quite visually appealing so there's the pieces that we're going to um, design so I'm going to going to work through the complete drawing as if I hadn't already made this um, we're only going to have to draw this piece once and then we'll just duplicate it and we'll draw this piece once and we'll duplicate it three times to give us all of the pieces that we need. Okay, so that's what we're going to draw. Um, just put that there and let's jump back to Inkscape. So I'll get rid of this path that I put in as an example. Um, I'm going to start by drawing the roof panel. So. I suppose maybe I might as well start with a, um, a rectangle for this. So when you draw a rectangle, um, you click and drag and you can set the width and the height. I'm gonna deliberately not aim to set it at the correct height yet. I'm just gonna draw any sized rectangle. What I'm gonna use then to make sure that it is the correct height is I'm gonna activate the select tool so we're currently using the rectangle tool, which I had clicked in the toolbar here. The top tool in this toolbar is what they call the select tool. It can be activated using the hotkey S, or you can just click on the button in the toolbar. And once you have selected an object, the toolbar at the top of the Inkscape window shows you options for the current object with the currently selected tool. 
So we're using the select tool. So it's going to allow us to set the X and Y coordinates of the object. Uh, so let's, for example, set that. I'm going to move it up near the top left corner. Let's move it 10 millimeters away from the left side of the canvas and 10 millimeters from the top. So that's the X and Y coordinates at this rectangle. And then I'm going to set the width to be the desired width of this piece, which is 80. And I'll set the height to be 80 as well. Um, there is a little lock symbol here that you can click if you want to preserve the aspect ratio. Um, if you click that, then when you change one of these numbers, the width or the height, it will change the um, it will change the other one to preserve the aspect ratio. Um, so in this case, I'm going to leave it unlocked, but uh, that's useful to be aware of if you have pieces that you want to preserve the shape but change the scale of them. Um, something else that's worth pointing out just while we're looking at these text fields up here is these edit boxes have all got a bit of a secret hidden power which is that you can put in arithmetic expressions in here and it will calculate the, the it, or it will evaluate those expressions and then apply the value that it's calculated to the property associated with that text box. So for example, currently uh, the X coordinate of that rectangle is set to 10. If I wanted to move that 50 millimeters to the right, I could say 10 plus 50 press return and it will calculate that 10 plus 50 is 60 and it will move the object over. Now, in that particular case, it would be easy to calculate that it's 60, but if I wanted to move a load of objects uh, from the current position, move them over by a certain amount, I could select all the objects and apply the same uh, arithmetic operation here and it will apply it to all of the objects. So it can be very useful. The other thing is that it can be really good if you want to scale an object uh, you can do that here. I'm going to lock the aspect ratio and let's just try multiplying this by 1.5. And you can see that it scales the object by the factor that you've um, typed in here. So that uh, ability to um, apply arithmetic operations here is really useful for scaling, transforming, um, adjusting pieces. Um, you can select one or more objects and you know, use these properties here to apply some transformation to all of them. And um, so those boxes are much more useful than they maybe appear at first. And um, the other thing is that for these, um, for all those objects there, you can also use them to manipulate individual nodes in a path. So we'll probably do that uh, a little bit later on. Now that object that I drew there, because I drew it with the rectangle tool, uh, it's currently stored as a rectangle object rather than a path. And I would prefer to have all of my objects be paths. So if you look down at the bottom there, I've selected that object by clicking and dragging a box around it. So you can see that it's currently selected. And in the status bar at the bottom, it says rectangle in layer one. So there is only one layer in this image, but it's basically telling us that the selected object is a rectangle. Now I would prefer that to be a path. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up to the path menu here and I'm going to click on object to path, which just says whatever type of object is currently selected, turn that into a path. So I've just clicked that and you can see that the object is now recognized by Inkscape. If you look at the status bar at the bottom, it's recognized as a path with four nodes. And indeed, if I click the node tool here, you can see those four nodes and they could, for example, be uh, individually edited. So that's the first uh, outline, or, or that's the outer perimeter of our first piece. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to create a slot and then I'm going to add it in four times into this shape. So I'm going to highlight the current uh, path th uh, that we've already drawn and I'm going to click on Control D to duplicate. So I've just duplicated that object by clicking Control D. So there's now two paths, one directly on top of the other. So I'm going to drag the one I've created over here so that we can see the two of them separately. And I'm going to change the shape of this one. So I'm just going to do that using the width and height properties up here. And I want to make the width of it 20 millimeters and I want to make the height three millimeters. So I currently have the aspect ratio locked. So I need to unlock that so that I can change the height without changing the width. 
Uh, so now I've got a 20 by three rectangle here and I wanna put four of these in on top of this shape. So first I'm gonna zoom in a little bit here just so we can see what we're doing more clearly. So I'm holding down the control key and then using the arrow keys to pan around. And then to zoom in, I just click on plus a few times. Okay. Now I'm gonna need four of these, so I'll duplicate that using control D and then I'll select both of them. Hit control D again to duplicate. So I've got four slots now and it's just a matter of positioning them relative to this shape here. So this will be a good example of using the alignment tools in Inkscape. So to access the alignment tools, you can either go through the object menu and then at the very bottom of that menu, you'll find align and distribute, or you can press the shortcut key, shift control A. Um, so the dialog box that pops up will appear on the right side of the window here, and it provides all sorts of different options for positioning objects relative to other objects or relative to the page or whatever. In this case, we're gonna position each of these objects relative to this existing path here. So I'll just select one of the little um, slots here first. And so I selected that by clicking and dragging a box around it, but you can also select an object just by clicking on it. Um, so I'll click on one object and I'm gonna hold down the shift key uh, and click on a second object, which is gonna be this larger path over here. So I've selected two paths now, the little slot and the large outline here. If I go over to the align dialog box, I'm gonna say that I want to do alignment relative to the last selected object. So I was careful to select the larger square second out of the two objects. So that is the last selected object. So that means that whatever alignment operations I apply, it's gonna be aligning this little slot relative to that larger square. So for example, let's try uh, centering the vertical axis of the two objects. Uh, similarly, we can center the vert or center the horizontal axis of the two objects. So let's basically put that little slot right in the middle of this square here. Now that actually isn't quite what we want yet, but um, it's getting, at least we've got it horizontally centered, but where I'd really like it to be is, well, I'd wanna put one slot just up here and one slot down here. So in order to do that, I am gonna say, first align the top edges of the two selected objects and it's aligning still relative to the last selected object. So that's gonna move the little slot up so that its upper edge is lined up with the upper edge of the large square. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drag a box around just the smaller object so that now I've only selected that one object and I wanna move it down. Um, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna move it in uh, nine millimeters from the edge. So I'm gonna do that for the four slots all around the four edges. I'm gonna center them all on that side of the square and then push them in by nine. So to do that, I'm just gonna use the Y uh, coordinate of the shape. I'm just gonna add nine to it. And that, that will push it in by nine millimeters. It's already centered relative to the square. Okay, so we'll take another one of these uh, little slots and I'm gonna hold down the shift key again, select the square. And again, I'm gonna align relative to the last selected object, which was the larger square. And I'm gonna say center it. So that has horizontally centered it within the square. And I wanna do the same thing that I did before, except on the bottom edge. So I'm gonna align the bottom edges of the two objects using this button here. And um, now if I select that individual slot there, I can subtract nine from it and that will pull it in from the edge by nine. Now we have a few different options for how we go about um, the last two slots. So one way we could do it is to select one of these and use these buttons up here to rotate by 90 degrees. So I'm just gonna rotate it 90 degrees and then hold down shift and select the square. So now I've got the, the rotated slot and the large square selected. So I can do align their centers on a horizontal axis and then align their right edges. Then I can push the slot in by subtracting nine from its Y coordinate, or sorry, from its X coordinate. Uh, so that's one option for what we could do. 
We could do the same with the fourth slot. I might just show you a different way that you could go about doing that though. So um, I'm gonna get rid of these two slots for a minute and I'm gonna take these two here and I'm gonna group these objects to so that they can be moved around as a single object. So to do that, you uh, select the objects that you want to group and then press Control G to group them. So they're gonna behave like a single object until we ungroup them. So they can be ungrouped later using Control Shift G uh, to return them to being individual objects. But at the moment, they're gonna behave like a single object. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna duplicate that object. And then I'm gonna rotate the duplicated object. And it's basically gonna rotate it centered on the center point of the grouped object. So that's already gonna be basically perfectly positioned within the square. So now I can select the four slots um, and I can ungroup the two of them using Control Shift G. So now we're back to having five path objects. And we can confirm that by dragging a box around all five of them. Uh, sorry, let me try that again. So I can select all five objects. And if you look in the status bar at the bottom, you can see five objects selected of type path. So we're back to having five individual path objects, which is what we want. Okay, so that's our first piece drawn. I'm actually gonna group that entire object uh, using Control G, and then I'm gonna duplicate it. And then I'm gonna take the duplicated object over here, and we might as well just align them nicely relative to each other. So I'm gonna um, use one of the buttons we haven't used up to now, which is to align one object to the right of another object. So in this case, the little green dot in the icon there indicates the object that you're aligning relative to, and the rest of the objects, which in this case is just one other object, is gonna have its left edge aligned with the right edge of the reference object. So it's basically slid just up against um, the other object, and then I'm gonna line up their upper edges. And um, finally, just to give a bit of space between them so that when they're laser cut, it doesn't, the laser doesn't end up cutting down the same line twice. I'm just gonna slide it over a little bit there. Okay, so that's our roof and our floor. Uh, so we're making good hideaway here. I'm just gonna create the, um, the wall panel now. So if I select all of these and ungroup, I'll be able to access an individual rectangle here again. So select that, duplicate, and this is gonna be a rectangle that I'm gonna uh, reshape now to form the wall. So first thing I'm gonna do is set the width of that to be 40, and I'm gonna set the height to be 80, just to get it roughly the right size. And uh, zoom out a little bit here. Now, what we would like to do, um, we this is basically the size of the wall without the two sort of extra parts on the top and the bottom. So if you remember, if we just return to the sketch here, at the top and bottom of each of these wall panels, there's a little sort of an outcropping part that's gonna slide into this receiving slot here. So it's basically the, the extra little extended piece here. So I need to add on these bits onto the end of that rectangle. Now there's lots of different ways you could do it, but I'm gonna show you the way that I would typically do this, right? Um, I'm gonna take another one of these rectangles here and um, from the slots up above, and I'm gonna duplicate it and just drag it down. And I'm gonna make this longer than it needs to be. So it doesn't matter exactly how long you make it, I just wanna make sure it's longer than that sort of extra fin needs to be protruding out the end of this piece here. We already know that it's the correct width because we actually started out with the, the slot here. So the length of that slot there has to be the same width of the extended piece here. Um, so I'm gonna take this rectangle now, I'm gonna line it up with the wall. So first I will align their upper edges and then I'm gonna center them together. And what I'm gonna do is, I know that I want this to extend out three millimeters. So once I have this just perfectly at the edge of this uh, rectangular wall here, um, I know that if I adjust the Y coordinate by exactly three millimeters, now it's extending three millimeters beyond the edge of the path. Now I'm gonna duplicate that piece and I am gonna align that with the bottom and move it down by three. So I'm gonna add three onto its Y coordinate. 
Now, what we want to do here is we basically want a shape that's the combination of all of these together. The problem is that if we were to cut this as it is now, the laser is going to cut this out. We'd end up with one, two, three, four, five different pieces because the laser would be cutting them all into separate pieces. What we want to do is get rid of these lines in here where we don't want the laser to cut. So there's a few different ways you can do it, but the fact that they are paths means that we can access those operations that I mentioned earlier under the path menu. So if I open the path menu here, you can see you've got union, difference, intersection, and so on. So these allow you to combine different, the shape of different paths in different ways. In this case, what we actually want is union. So we want to get the shape, which includes the interior of all of the selected shapes. So I'm just going to click that. And you can see that it gives us a single outline here. And that outline encloses everything that was enclosed in the three selected objects. So that's basically it. That's our wall drawn. And um, we're going to need to duplicate that, of course. So duplicate it once, duplicate it twice, duplicate it thrice. And we can put these up close to where the other ones are here. And that's basically it. That's our drawing done. So the way that we would save this um, is, uh, in this case, I've already saved it as drawing.svg. So it's always a good idea to save uh, using the native file format of Inkscape SVG so that if you need to edit the pattern later on, you'll be able to go back and everything is going to be exactly the way that you left it and you'll still be able to edit all the shapes the same way. You can import lots of other file types into Inkscape. So even if you saved it as a different file type, you could probably load it back in. But to keep things working as smoothly as possible, it's always a good idea to save the reference copy of your design using the native file format, which is SVG. Um, so in that case, I had already saved uh, drawing.svg. However, you can also save a copy. And what we actually do for, with the laser cutter is we also save the drawing as a PDF. Um, and what the PDF, uh, what happens with the PDF is the laser cutter appears like a printer essentially to the computer that it's plugged into. So sending a design to the laser cutter to be cut out is a lot like just sending a document to the printer. So in this case, we just open up a PDF viewer and it's like printing it, except that it's actually getting cut out by the laser. Now there's one step that I didn't perform there. And normally um, the way we organize it with designs that students send to me, uh, they just send me the designs. And then I do a final step to ensure that the width of all the lines is correctly set so that they're thin black lines and nothing else. But just to remind you or to explain like what happens in that final step, um, we're still in outline view here. So we've drawn the shapes that we wanted. But if I go back to the view menu and we return to normal view, you can see that these shapes, they've actually all got red fill and they've got these like different thickness strokes around the edge. Now the reason that they don't all have the same thickness of stroke um, that we originally set is that I scaled a lot of these objects and the stroke width has scaled with them. So we've ended up with a selection of different stroke widths. Now luckily we're using geometric bounding box, so that's not going to affect, you know, the final strokes that we end up cutting but we don't want we can't send this drawing to the laser cutter the way that it is so what we would normally do at this point is select all of the objects and um, it's a good idea to ungroup everything just in case there are grouped objects in here so i normally hold down Control shift g and ungroup a few times and then once everything is selected just look at the status bar down here and see yeah i've got 14 objects of type path so if there were other types of objects here i would at this point, convert them to be paths so that I would be able to set the fill and stroke properties of all of them the same way. So I have all those objects selected. I'm going to go to the fill and stroke uh, settings here. And I'm going to set the fill to be transparent or no paint. So we're not going to have any fill. I'm going to set the stroke paint to be black. So to do that, um, well, there's different ways we could do it. Um, I think I'll select RGB here. I just set zero, 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 so that all of them have got a solid black line. 
Now, it's also important that the blur is set to zero and opacity is set to 100. That will be the default, but just in case you have changed that for any reason, um, it is a requirement that the blur and opacity are set to zero and 100 respectively. Um, and then finally, for the stroke style, uh, we want to set that to be very thin. So um, what will I do here? I'll set this to 0 0.01 millimeters. So that really, really is thin. Let me 0 0.01 millimeters. Um, so there is some threshold thickness below which the laser cutter interprets a line as being a cut line rather than something that it's supposed to engrave. So the laser cutter can also engrave. Um, most of the time though, uh, we're just doing cutting and therefore we need to make sure that the lines are thin enough that they're interpreted as cut lines. So 0 0.01 millimeters is definitely thin enough. So um, one of the sort of uh, challenges, I suppose, with having the lines set that thin is that in normal view, you just can't hardly see those lines at all. Like I, to me, I can't see them at all on the screen right now, which is why um, it can be reassuring a lot of the time to be in outline view so that even if the lines are very thin, they're still clearly visible in outline view. So I'm going to save that drawing again. So just hit Control S to save it. Um, and I'm going to save the PDF again as well. So I got to save as copy and I just save as a drawing.pdf. Yeah, I'll replace that. And let's actually take a look at that PDF. Um, so I think I saved that in the downloads folder. Yeah, there's drawing.pdf. So if I open that up in a PDF viewer, you can see there's the lines there. This is actually what we would end up sending to the laser cutter. Um, and it's literally anywhere that we've drawn a black line, that's where the laser is going to cut. And those are the pieces that you would get back. So in this case, you'll end up with one big sheet with these holes cut in it. Uh, you'll get four separate pieces for these two larger square pieces, but you also get like these eight tiny little rectangles of wood will be cut out as well. Um, and that's what you're going to end up with. So you get, you would get back the same set of pieces that I have here. Plus you'd probably get those little eight rectangles back if that's what you've drawn. So I think that's probably a good place to stop.